All right. So welcome every more every Monday to our uh, Wednesday morning um, orthopedic surgery grand rounds. Um, for today's presentation, um, I will turn it over to Dr. Brian Feely uh, to provide an introduction. All right. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Davies. Uh, Dr. Davies has a uh, long and polished CV, similar to many uh, faculty in other departments, and yet he's only an R4. Uh, Michael grew up in San Diego. Uh, he went to Stanford where he got his BS, and then went to UCSF, and I was fortunate enough to have him in the lab for a research year. Um, on a personal note, I'm happy to say that Dr. Davies is, most importantly, engaged um, recently and probably almost equally importantly is sports medicine bound. Um, ever since Dr. Davies started doing this research, he's basically been a factory for getting um, grants and research awards. He's won research awards in almost every year except for 2020, highlighted by the ORAF Excellence and Research Award twice, um, Med Student Awards, and then this summer, the AOSSM Excellence in Research Award of 2021. He's also gotten the AOSSM Young Investigator Grant, which is a pretty large grant, um, as well as recently this last year was he got grants from the OREF and the um, ON Network, which is from ORS. So I'm happy to introduce him and turn it over to Dr. Davies, where he's gonna talk about his research on muscle stem cells. Thanks so much, Dr. Feely, for that kind introduction. So the story, gonna be, the story that I'm gonna be telling today is really uh, a continuation of a story that began almost eight years ago when I was a first year med student at UCSF looking for a summer research project. Uh, one of my good friends from med school had expressed some interest in a basic science project involving the rotator cuff that was gonna be conducted at a lab over at the VA. Uh, but at the last minute, and to my good fortune, he bailed on the project after having told me a little bit about it. I thought it sounded interesting, so I set up a meeting with Dr. Feely at the Starbucks down the street from the OI. And here I am eight years later to explain to you exactly what I've learned over that period of time. Uh, so my talk is called Unlocking the Intrinsic Potential of Muscle Stem Cells to Treat Muscle Degeneration. Research funding sources for some of the research that I'm going to present come from the AOSSM, REF, ON, VA, and NIH, and I have no other relevant disclosures. So the three key objectives that I have for this talk today are to discuss some of the important features of muscle degeneration, which we see common to many different musculoskeletal diseases. I'm going to talk about the cellular basis in particular for intramuscular fat and fibrosis, and finally, and most importantly, I'm gonna talk about the evolution of some of the translational approaches that we've seen to treating these diseases, as well as the evolution in the methods that we're using to get there. So if you were to take a muscle biopsy from the avid CrossFit athlete that you see on the right here, you might see something like this on an H&E stain. You would see these geometric muscle fibers of similar size with very little interstitial tissue in between them. So I want you to remember what this histology looks like and then contrast that to this picture. So this is a muscle biopsy from a 15 year old male with progressive muscle weakness. And you can appreciate all of these white fat cells interspersed within the muscle, as well as these small round muscle fibers and some of this interstitial pink uh, fibrosis. From a 77 year old woman with an inability to abduct her shoulder more than 45 degrees. So again, you see interspersed fat and fibrotic tissue in a background with these small muscle fibers. And finally, we have a muscle sample from the multifidus of a 63-year-old man with chronic low back pain in the setting of lumbar intervertebral disc degeneration. And again, the asterisks here highlight fat deposition within the muscle. So what do these patients have in common? You have a patient with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, a patient with a chronic supraspinatus tear, and then a patient with multifidus degeneration in the setting of uh, disc degeneration. The two pathologic factors that I really wanna focus on are muscle fibrosis, which you can see here in the trichrome stain to the left, indicated by this blue interstitial tissue kind of surrounding the muscle fibers, and fatty infiltration, 
shown here as these white adipocytes interspersed between the muscle fibers. Uh, muscle atrophy is very interesting and an independent biological process, but it's not going to be the primary focus of this talk. So why does this matter to us as orthopedic surgeons clinically? We see patients all the time with different varieties of muscle degeneration involving fatty infiltration and fibrosis. So whether we're in sports clinics seeing patients with chronic rotator cuff tears, whether we're in spine clinics seeing patients with low back pain and disc degeneration that have fatty infiltration of their multifidus muscle, or whether we're in arthroplasty clinic evaluating a patient with a Trendelenburg gait who's found to have fatty infiltration of the glute medius, uh, we see this type of pathology across all subspecialties within orthopedics. And so where does intramuscular fat and fibrosis actually come from? This is going to be one of the guiding questions of the rest of this talk. So in 2004, Dr. Christian Gerber and his research group published a study in the Journal of Orthopedic Research that attempted to explain the pathomechanics of fat development in the rotator cuff. What Dr. Gerber and his colleagues observed is that when you have muscle fibers that retract, the angle between the longitudinal fibers, shown here as the alpha on the left and the beta here on the right, increases. So this is known as the penation angle. And his hypothesis was that this increasing space between the muscle fibers might allow fat and fibrosis to infiltrate between the muscle fibers. Now, part of this hypothesis would sort of presuppose that fat and fibrotic tissue could actually move into the muscle, but it also raises a question of, you know, whether there may be precursor cells for these fat, these fat and fibrotic findings that are present within the muscle already. So that question was partially addressed in 2010 when two different research groups published in the same issue of Nature Cell Biology describing this uh, new population of stem cells within muscle known as fibroadipogenic progenitors or FAPs. And the key defining feature of the stem cell population is that they express the surface marker PDGF or alpha. So you can see a stain of PDGF or alpha positive FAPs off to the right here. Uh, and specifically Joe et al in the first study found that this population of stem cells is necessary for normal muscle regeneration after an acute chemotoxic injury to muscle. So they basically injected some mice with the cardiotoxin and found that if you block the response of these PDGF or alpha positive cells, the muscle fibers regenerate smaller and slower compared to if you have these PDGF or alpha positive cells uh, able to participate in that regeneration process. However, in, in that same issue of nature, another group uh, led by Uzumi et al found that in the setting of chronic inflammation and chronic injury, and also in a muscular dystrophy mouse model, these cells actually give rise to adipocytes or fat cells within the muscle. And so to the right here, you can see some of these cells which we've differentiated in our lab uh, to promote their turning into perilipin positive adipocytes here on this figure or collagen 1A positive fibroblasts in the figure on the right. So what was the early understanding about these cells? The early thought was that FAPs are present along muscle fibers along with myogenic stem cells such as satellite cells indicated here by the purple circle and that if you have a breakdown in communication between FAPs and satellite cells this allows these FAPs to begin to divide and proliferate and differentiate into adipocytes and fibroblasts. And this might lead to that clinically apparent uh, fatty infiltration and fibrosis um, previously described. And given that these cells might have a pro-regenerative function in addition to this detrimental function, they've been described as a double-edged sword within skeletal muscle. Now, since 2010, there have been numerous studies implicating this particular stem cell population in the pathogenesis of muscle degeneration in a variety of settings. So that there have been papers looking at FAPs in ALS, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, even muscle fibrosis and chronic kidney disease. And within the Feely Lou lab, our own uh, AJ Aga and the rest of the team have 
pioneered studies looking at the effects of fatty degeneration of the multifidus muscle and implicating FAPS, as well as conducting uh, multiple studies looking at rotator cuff tear degeneration and the role of these cells. Even with rare pathologies, um, such as fasciosscapulohumeral muscular dystrophy, uh, there have been recent studies implicating FAPS in the fatty replacement of the muscle through kind of aberrant uh, proliferation and differentiation of these stem cells. So this raises the question, how can we apply this baseline knowledge about this wide spanning group of musculoskeletal diseases uh, that seem to implicate this particular population of stem cells and how can we begin to address this translationally? So one important first step in progressing translational research is uh, having a clinically relevant small animal model in which to study potential therapeutic applications. So in 2012, the lab developed a mouse model of massive rotator cuff tears. So this consisted of a tendon transection injury shown here on the left, uh, whereby the supraspinatus and infraspinatus were sharply transected and allowed to retract in addition to a suprascapular nerve resection. And what the group found from this study is that this produces reliable fatty infiltration and fibrosis uh, of the injured rotator cuff by about six weeks after injury. Since that study in 2012, uh, the model has actually been updated to be even more clinically relevant by first tagging the rotator cuff tendons, allowing them to retract and then performing a delayed repair with 7-0 proline suture uh, between two to six weeks after injury. And what we've seen is that the further delayed the repair is, the more persistent muscle degeneration you see, uh, similar to what is seen in patients undergoing a rotator cuff repair who already have uh, severe muscle degeneration. And on the lines of increasing clinical relevance, I just wanted to give a quick blurb about some of the most recent functional analysis that we're conducting, uh, which uses machine learning based imaging analysis to track the paws of mice in space as they perform an upper extremity task, um, such as the string pull, which you see right here, uh, which you know is somewhat analogous to a rope pull that a person might do in a gym. And so this, this allows us to kind of study the functional effects of these types of injury models um, and again helps the translational aspect of the research. Finally, I want to give a quick blurb on using reporter mice to spatially localize a protein of interest. So we frequently use uh, PDGF or alpha GFP reporter mice to track facts within the muscle. So what this means is that GFP, this green fluorescent protein, is used as our reporter signal underneath the promoter, which attaches that protein <clears throat> to one of the histone proteins present in FAPS. And this allows us to essentially stain the FAPS as green within the muscle and kind of monitor their differentiation and track them over time. So combining some of those techniques, in 2016, the lab uh, found by using reporter mice that underwent a massive rotator cuff tear that FAPS seem to be the predominant source of adipocytes and a large contributor to fibroblasts within the uh, murine rotator cuff. And all of this leads to the next important question, which is, are FAPS necessary for fatty infiltration and fibrosis after mu muscle injury? In other words, if you stop them from proliferating and differentiating, what happens to the muscle fatty infiltration and fibrosis? So the first, therapeutic idea, which followed from that, was to block the signals that allow FAPS to survive and proliferate in injured muscle. And to concretely accomplish this, we used a small molecule inhibitor of TGF-beta in a mouse model of massive rotator cuff tear. So wild type mice underwent rotator cuff tear surgery and were kept alive for either two or six weeks after injury, before which time they were, or after which time they were sacrificed and their supraspinatus uh, muscles were harvested, both from the injured side, seen here in the bottom row, as well as from the contralateral side as a control. Uh, what we found performing a Mason trichrome stain looking at fibrosis was a large increase in the amount of this uh, bluish purple interstitial fibrosis 
in the group that received the vehicle treatment compared to a group, the group that received the TGF beta inhibitor. And this was present at both two and six weeks after injury. Similarly, performing an oil red O stain to look at fatty infiltration, which shows up as these reddish or orange globules between the tissue, we found that treatment with the inhibitor of TGF beta reduced the development of fatty infiltration in the injured supraspinatus at six months or six weeks after injury. Looking at the wet weights of the harvested muscle, what we found was that the inhibitor slightly reduced the amount of atrophy that developed, but there was still quite a bit of atrophy in the surgically injured uh, muscle samples of both the group that got the vehicle treatment as well as the inhibitor compared to the sham control side muscle. And then finally, implicating FAPS in this process. What we found was that treatment uh, with inhibitor reduced the number of FAPs present in the injured muscles. So that's seen in panel D down here compared to panel C, which is the vehicle group. And you see fewer of those PDGF or alpha positive FAPs. Uh, to better understand the mechanism behind this, we performed a tunnel assay, which stains for cells undergoing apoptosis. And what we found was was uh, treatment with the inhibitor significantly increased the number of FAPs undergoing apoptosis compared to the FAPs in the injured muscle that were not treated with the inhibitor. So all of this suggests that TGF beta is indeed a survival signal in the rotator cuff for FAPs, and that by blocking the signal with the inhibitor, we were again causing the FAPs to undergo apoptosis and not stick around where they could differentiate into more adipocytes and fibroblasts. So to summarize, we saw that inhibiting TGF beta reduced muscle fibrosis and fatty infiltration, and this correlated with a decrease in FAP number and an increase in FAP apoptosis. What we didn't know at this point, though, was really much about the physiologic role of FAPs and also really anything about what to do if, FAP, if fat has already uh, formed in muscle at the time of um, presentation or treatment. So at this point, Dr. Shue Lu in our lab suggested that we consider some of the work of another lab here at UCSF at the time, the lab of Dr. Shingo Kajimura, who was at that time studying different types of fat uh, in humans and, and other mammals and looking at the potential interchangeability between bad fat and good fat. And so I'm gonna spend a moment here and talk a little bit about these different types of fat. So, most of us, when we think of fat, we're thinking of white adipose. So this is the typical subcutaneous or visceral fat. It's relatively low in mitochondria. Uh, it's, you know, it, its main purpose is energy storage, storage of triglycerides, um, and it tends to have a bad rap. Uh, compare that to beige fat, which is thought to be an interchangeable type of fat seen in adult humans, which is very rich in mitochondria has high thermogenic potential and may actually be able to burn surrounding white fat through lipolysis in addition to secreting some growth factors which may be helpful for the surrounding environment. And then finally over here on the left, you have brown fat, which is present primarily in newborns and infants. And again, which is very highly metabolic, gives off a lot of heat and is packed with mitochondria. Uh, and the important distinguishing feature of Be a bright or beige fat and brown fat is that they are both, they both express a mitochondrial gene called UCP1. So that's important to kind of consider uh, looking at the experiments moving forward. And this is in contrast to white fat, which, it, which does not have that UCP1 expression. So we wondered at this point, could we actually leverage FAPs to make beige fat? And this led to the next therapeutic idea which was to promote the differentiation of FAPs into a beige adipose phenotype and see if that might be able to reduce the amount of fatty infiltration and maybe provide a local effect uh, that was beneficial to muscle. So to do this, we used a beta adrenergic agonist as it had been shown in the literature that beta agonists seem to promote the differentiation of pre-adipose cells into beige fat. And again, we did this in our mouse model of rotator cuff tear. So in the first study looking at this, we took some mice which were UCP1 tomato red reporter mice. So this means that the UCP1 positive FAPs show up as red in the muscle. 
and we, they underwent a rotator cuff tear, and then they were treated with the beta-3 agonist amabegron. And so this uh, treatment with amabegron was compared at a low dose and a high dose, and both of those were compared to a vehicle control uh, consisting of um, saline, and as well as uh, a sham surgery side. And what we found was that treatment with this agonist resulted in a dose-dependent increase in the amount of UCP1 expression within the injured muscle. So you saw the most UCP1 expression in uh, the injured muscle that got the high dose of the beta agonist treatment, seen over here on the right. And very interestingly, this inversely correlated with the amount of fat accumulation also in a dose-dependent manner. So in the mice that had the cuff tear and only got vehicle, they had the most fatty infiltration compared to the mice that underwent cuff tear and were treated with the higher dose of the beta agonist. Those mice had the least fatty infiltration seen over here on the right. Now to refine this therapeutic idea even further and really isolate the effect of these beige FAPs, these UCP1 positive FAPs, uh, we wanted to next transplant these beige FAPs directly into the injured rotator cuff muscle in order to sort of isolate those effects apart from treatment with a systemic beta agonist. And we performed this in both a mouse model of rotator cuff tear as well as a delayed mouse model of rotator cuff repair. So the data you see here from the initial rotator cuff tear injury model, where mice underwent either no treatment to their injured rotator cuff, a PDS injection, or on the right, injection with these UCP1 positive, PDGF or alpha positive beige FAPs, which had been isolated from reporter mice using flow cytometry. And we went on to quantify the amount of fibrosis, fat, as well as the amount of muscle atrophy that developed. And what we found is in the group that received the beige FAP injection, there was less fibrosis, less fat, and a greater muscle cross-sectional area um, at the six week time point after injury. And so we concluded that transplantation of beige FAPs reduces muscle degeneration. So what we've learned at this point is that murine FAPs can be induced to differentiate into this UCP1 positive beige adipose phenotype, and that beige adipose induction seems to decrease muscle fibrosis and fatty infiltration within our clinically relevant mouse model. What we still don't really understand though is besides burning white fat, what other growth factors, signals, or local effect might these cells have, and how might beige FAPs help with muscle regeneration? So specifically, we began to consider this question. How do these cells exert their effect? And would there be any way to concentrate this effect? So in general, when considering how stem cells might exert a local or paracrine effect, uh, one, one method to consider would be via the secretion of exosomes. So exosomes are a type of membrane-bound extracellular vesicle that can contain growth factors and nucleic acids, which can then be taken up by neighboring cells. And fortunately, again, being at UCSF, we have outstanding collaborators outside of our department, uh, this time in the form of the Refai lab, uh, who are basically exosome specialists and have developed uh, really advanced ultra centrifugation techniques to isolate exosomes from a variety of cell types, which can then be used in translational treatment models. So they helped us isolate exosomes from UCP1 positive FAPs as well as UCP1 negative FAPs, uh, which we were then able to apply to sort of our next set of translational experiments. So the therapeutic idea that evolved from this was to then try and isolate and concentrate these specific factors from beige FAPs and deliver them to injured muscle. And the specific technique for doing this was to focus on exosomes, to isolate these exosomes from beige FAPs and then assess their ability to promote myogenesis in vitro as well as in vivo. So what you see here are the results from our in vitro arm looking at the effects of exosomes. So what we did was we took exosomes from uh, UCP1 positive beige FAPs. So this first column here, we compared them to exosomes from non-beige FAPs, in other words, UCP1 negative FAPs. And then we also compared both of those treatments to exosome-free medium. 
And we treated two different cell lines here. So we treated C2C12 cells, which are mouse myoblasts. And then we also treated a mouse fibroblast cell line. And what we found in treating mouse myoblasts was that the exosomes from beige faps significantly increased the myotube fusion index. So these red linear structures here are myotubes. They stain positive for myosin heavy chain or MF20. And what we found was there was significantly greater myotube formation and fusion in the group that got exosomes from beige faps compared to the group that got exosomes from non-beige faps as well as from exosome free median. Uh, additionally, kind of looking at this fibroblast line of cells, uh, which is a non-myogenic cell line and should not typically differentiate into myotubes, we were surprised to find that treatment with exosomes from beige faps was actually sufficient to induce myogenic differentiation of this non-myogenic cell line. We did not see any myogenic differentiation in the non-beige fap uh, exosome group within the fibroblast line or with exosome free medium. So moving on to applying this exosome treatment strategy to our in vivo mouse rotator cuff model, we found that comparing the effects of PBS injection into the injured muscle to non-beige fat exosome injection to beige fat exosome injection, again, the injection with exosomes specifically from the beige fats reduced the amount of fibrosis and fatty infiltration seen trichrome stain and oil red stain here within the injured rotator cuff muscle of mice. Interestingly, the exosomes from the non-beige FAP or UCP1 negative FAPs actually increased the amount of fibrosis that we saw even compared to the saline group and showed a trend towards increasing the amount of fatty infiltration as well. Uh, and then when looking at muscle cross-sectional area, we found that exosomes from the beige FAPs were the most uh, useful in increasing cross-sectional area and also increasing the local expression of UCP1 within the recipient muscle. So to summarize that set of experiments, we saw that exosomes isolated from beige FAPs were able to increase my myotube fusion in vitro, cause transdifferentiation of a non-myogenic cell line into myotubes, and decrease atrophy, fibrosis, and fatty infiltration in vivo. Now, by this point, what we were really wondering is, do these cells and their corresponding exosomes actually exist in humans? How relevant you know, are these cells and their functions to patients? And so by this point, we really began to wonder, can we treat muscle? We know we can treat muscle degeneration in mice using our rotator cuff mouse model, but what about in humans? What about human cells? So to begin to answer this question, uh, we began collecting rotator cuff muscle biopsies from patients undergoing arthroscopic rotator cuff repair over at the OI. And we collected uh, biopsies from over from the supraspinatus muscle of over 20 patients over at the OI. And we collected a variety of patients who had either full thickness supraspinatus tears or partial thickness supraspinatus tears and looked at the amount of PDGF or alpha expression in the muscle, really tried to characterize the FAPs present in this muscle uh, and then also look at the differentiation capacity of these cells isolated uh, from the supraspinatus muscle samples. So what we found looking at the top row here is that patients with full thickness supraspinatus tears um, have more PDGF or alpha positive FAPs than those with partial thickness tears. And then furthermore, isolating these cells uh, and growing them under conditions to promote their differentiation into fibroblasts or promote their differentiation into adipocytes, we found again that full thickness tears uh, tended to have FAPs which were more predisposed to differentiating into fibroblasts, shown here as an increase in alpha SMA expression, as well as adipocytes, shown here as an increase in perilipin A expression. We also wanted to consider other variables besides just tear size. So we looked at the effects of age in conjunction with tear size in a multivariable regression. And what we found is that uh, rotator cuff tear size when it comes to differentiation of these cells seems to primarily promote uh, differentiation into adipogenic and fibrogenic uh, cells. So in other words, these perilipin positive adipocytes and these alpha SMA positive fibroblasts are promoted by increasing tear size while beige differentiation is actually limited by increasing tear size. Uh, 
age showed a smaller effect size, but also an independent positive predisposition uh, to differentiating into adipogenic, fibrogenic, as well as beige uh, phenotype. So when it came to beige differentiation, age and tear size actually showed opposite effects, um, which was a little bit interesting and unexpected. Now, in parallel with those studies, we were also beginning to look at the role of FAPS in patient muscle samples from areas outside of the rotator cuff. And so our, our very own AJ Aga spearheaded a study which demonstrated that patients with disc herniation undergoing lumbar discectomy had significantly more PDGF or alpha positive FAPS in their multifidus muscle compared to patients uh, undergoing ACL surgery with hamstring uh, autograft who had fewer FAPS and less muscle degeneration in their muscle. And so in this top panel here, you can see the higher density of PDGF or alpha positive FAPS, uh, which correlated with worsening muscle quality in the patients with multifidus uh, degeneration. So by this point, we've learned that FAPS are integral in the development of fibrosis and fatty filtration in humans as well as mice, that human FAPS actually possess the ability to undergo beige adipogenic differentiation. But what we still don't know is, are there subsets of FAPS in humans that are responsible for, for the possible promyogenic benefits that we were seeing in mice? And how might we go about characterizing subsets of these cells within humans? And in trying to characterize subpopulations of FAPS in humans, we're met with a couple of goals. Might do the same sort of fluorescent genetic labeling uh, that we can do in mice, for example, nor can we do the typical genetic knock-in or knock-out exper experiments that are possible in mice. However, one extremely powerful emerging tool which can really help us to characterize the heterogeneity of cell populations is something called single cell RNA sequencing. So the way this works is in a, in a tiny microfluidics tube, you basically have one line with your cell populations of interest and then you have another line entering with barcoded beads, which each contain a unique set of barcodes. And so a single cell is encapsulated with a single set of barcodes in one oil droplet. And this basically allows for the barcodes to hybridize to the RNA present in the cell. And what it gives you is a unique and individual tag to the RNA from every single cell that you have sorted. So you can then look at the individual transcriptome from all of those cells and then perform some analysis to basically compare the similarity from cell to cell in their transcriptome, which allows you to make some conclusions about different populations of cells present in what would otherwise be a heterogeneous cluster of cells. So this is what a single cell RNA sequencing experiment looks like that we performed with human FAPs uh, that were grown under adipogenic media, as well as in media containing a beta-2 agonist for Motorol. And so the way that you interpret this graph here, so each one of these individual dots represents one cell. And you can see that they're clustered by different colors here. And what each one of these different clusters represents is a population of individual cells which have similar uh, transcriptional profiles. And so you can then look at the genes that are expressed in these different populations. And here we saw seven different populations and you can draw conclusions about the overall uh, sort of transcriptional um, genotype of, of those populations. And so for example, the populations five and six here showed high expression of surface markers of white, uh, white as well as beige adipose. And so we concluded that these were the more mature adipogenic differentiating FAPs compared to population seven, for example, which showed a lot of genes related to the cell cycle, proliferation, division. So we concluded that these are FAPs that are undergoing proliferation. And populations one through four contained really high PDGF or alpha expression, again, the surface marker of FAPs, as well as more markers related to stemness. And so we concluded that these represent varying degrees of uh, stem cell FAPs kind of going through different stages of transition into adipogenic FAPs. So how do we actually apply this data? So here's another single cell RNA sequencing experiment where we took human FAPs uh, that were treated with either standard FAP medium compared to Mirabegron, which is a beta-3 agonist. And then we looked sort of by these five populations that were identified at some of the top differentially regulated genes. 
So on the right, you have what's called a dot plot. And you can see by the key over on the right here that expression is essentially higher expression is represented by a darker blue color. So the darkest blue means that these are kind of the, the higher, um, higher expressed genes. And then the percent expressed here means what percentage of the overall cells were expressing that particular gene. So for example, the way you can use this data is you can see that population five here is highly enriched in CD63 and CD81, which are markers for exosomes. So you could investigate this population further, which we are in the process of doing, to see whether this population might contain some of those key exosomes, which we saw in mice conveyed such a promyogenic effect. Now, another interesting finding that we saw with the single cell RNA sequencing is that when you treat human FAPs with a beta agonist, whether it's Miravegron, which is a beta-3 agonist, or Formoterol, which is a beta-2 agonist, you see a really dramatic upregulation in markers related to mitochondrial biogenesis. So that's what all of these markers on the left here are, um, these MT genes. These are genes related to the structure of mitochondria. And we saw a big upregula upregulation of all those genes in the cells that were treated with Miravegron. Similarly with Promoterol, this is just a different graphical representation, but what we saw was a much higher mean expression of mitochondrial related genes with Promoterol treatment. And so that really begs the question, what is the significance of increased mitochondrial biogenesis in FAPS? So taking a step back again, mitochondria are very important in muscle function. And when you see loss of mitochondrial regulation, uh, you know, this is seen across a variety of muscle disease processes, including ALS at the level of the neuromuscular junction, as well as within the inherited mitochondrial myopathies. So those are relatively rare examples, but more recent research suggests that mitochondrial metabolism might even be essential for rotator cuff disease, and that patients with type 2 diabetes show abnormalities in their mitochondria uh, in skeletal muscle. So how might this be relevant to the stem cells that we're studying here? So I want to tell you a little bit about a phenomenon known as mitochondrial donation, which has been described in other stem cell populations by which cells can directly transfer their own mitochondria to other cells, the result of which seems to be to improve oxidative metabolism of the recipient cells. And this has been shown to occur via several different mechanisms. Uh, so shown here in panel A is something called a tunneling nanotubule or TNT. It's basically a cell process that extends directly from a donor cell to a recipient cell to allow the transfer of mitochondria. Uh, a dendrite is a similar um, sort of cell uh, actin-based process. And then you have microvesicles similar to extracellular vesicles or exosomes. And finally, you can have direct extrusion and internalization of these mitochondria. And so since this phenomenon was first described in mesenchymal stem cells in 2006, there have been several different papers assessing mitochondrial transfer among different mesenchymal stem cell populations in different tissue settings. So in the setting of acute lung injury, as well as in the setting of nervous system injury by which Schwann cells are able to donate their mitochondria to neurons. So we were curious, could this be going on in muscle? And do we think FAPS could potentially be playing a role in this, particularly given their upregulation of mitochondrial genes that we saw with our single cell RNA sequencing? So our approach was to label live FAPS with mitochondria specific dyes and then co-culture them with unlabeled myoblasts and satellite cells and try to detect transfer of labeled mitochondria. So what you see here is a time-lapse video that I'm going to play uh, which is going to demonstrate the transfer of mitotracker red stained mitochondria based in FAPS. So these red cells here that you're about to see are FAPS. And then what you're going to see are some yellow circles, which are going to encapsulate unlabeled myoblasts. And I want you to watch closely as uh, the dye containing mitochondria from the FAPS seem to illuminate these um, unlabeled myoblasts to the point where by the end of this time lapse, which took over, was sped up, but took over three hours, um, you can really see these sort of bright myoblasts, which have taken up the red labeled mitochondria from, from adjacent FAPs. So here is a 
40, 40X sort of blown up image, again, showing this process, this time with MitoTracker green labeling of FAPs. So these sort of stringy hair looking structures within these FAPs shown here are mitochondria. And you can see direct extension of a cellular process to these uh, nuclear blue labeled myoblasts. So these are myoblasts which were only labeled with nuke blue, but after 24 hours of co-incubation with these mitotracker green FAPs, now show some uptake of the mitotracker green signal within their cytoplasm, and in this case, even show direct contact with the FAPs. And we've assessed the directionality of this transfer. So we've seen that um, when you stain FAPs with mitotracker red and myoblasts with mitotracker green shown in the upper right hand panel and then co-culture them, ultimately what you see is the uptake of red mitochondria in the myoblasts and not the uptake of green mitochondria in the FAPs. And we can conclude this from sort of the yellow co-localization of the red and green mitochondria in the myoblasts, but not in the FAPs, suggesting that the directionality of this transfer is from FAPs to myoblasts. And we're able to further quantify this process using FACS flow cytometry by staining FAPs with one uh, fluorescent dye, so mitotracker green, and stabling human satellite cells with another fluorescent dye called CFSE red. And when you co-culture these cells together and then sort them all together using FACS, what you can see is this population here of satellite cells, which shows uptake of the green labeled mitochondria that must have come uh, from the FAPs since we don't see any of that green signal in the CFSE stained satellite cells, which were grown alone without FAPs. But really the important question is, is there a functional significance to this process? You know, we may have stumbled upon a new physiologic process, uh, but could this have any functional consequences? So to better answer this question, we isolated uh, FAPs, we isolated mitochondria from FAPs that were stained with mitotracker green, and then we use them to treat uh, human satellite cells <clears throat> shown here stained with CFSE far red. So the red cells here are satellite cells. These green specks in the upper panel are mitochondria isolated from FAPs. We then grew the satellite cells in regular skeletal muscle medium for two weeks before staining them for markers of myotube formation. So the genes Desmond and MF20 are markers of myotubes. And what we found was there was more than double the amount of myotube fusion in the satellite cells that had been treated with the isolated FAP mitochondria. So this suggests a powerful role in these mitochondria, which we were, which essentially we gave to the satellite cells. So here we've seen the beta agonists upregulate genes involved in mitochondrial biogenesis. We've seen that live cell imaging demonstrates that mitochondria from FAPs can be taken up by the surrounding satellite cells and myoblasts. And then finally, we've seen that if you isolate those mitochondria from FAPs and use them to treat satellite cells directly, this increases myogenesis in vitro. So now after all of that, in the last few minutes of the talk here, I wanna tell you that there might actually be another paradigm shift on the horizon. And there might actually be a way to turn these FAPs, which were originally described as non-myogenic cells into myoblasts and eventually myocytes, sort of breaking all of the established paradigms since the discovery of these cells in 2010. So just a couple months ago, there was a paper published in Science Advance, uh, which basically showed that using a histone deacetylase inhibitor drug can reprogram FAPs from undergoing adipogenic differentiation, seen in the controlled medium here to the left, to myogenic differentiation. So these cells on the right were also grown in adipogenic media after 48 hours of treatment with this particular HDAC inhibitor, A366. And what you see are not a bunch of fat cells, but a bunch of myosin heavy chain positive myotubes uh, that formed from these FAPs. The mechanism here um, is that the HDAC inhibitor seems to inhibit a particular gene PRDM16 which then unlocks the potential of these FAPs to undergo myogenic differentiation. So immediately we wanted to know whether this process could occur in human cells. So here are some of the preliminary results that we've collected over the past couple months or so studying the in vitro effects of this drug, A366, on human muscle-derived FAPs. <clears throat> 
So what you see here are FAPs that were collected as surgical waste from the hip muscle of arthroplasty patients. So thank you, Dr. Vale, which have been treated with this drug for 48 hours in standard FAP medium before being switched to adipogenic medium. And what you see at the end of two weeks is robust myotube formation in the form of these dystrophin and desmin positive myotubes. And if you look at the amount of fat that forms, even though these cells were being formed in adipogenic medium, it's very little perilipin staining and much more myosin uh, heavy chain staining. And then just on the horizon here, we've also been using some of our single cell RNA sequencing technique to look and see if there's a transcriptional uh, evidence for this process. And so Dr. Steven Garcia, who's currently in the Feely Lou lab has been instrumental in this part of the analysis. Basically what we see with the single cell RNA-seq is there's a population that clearly express all the markers that we associate with FAPS. There's then this large cluster of cells over here which represent uh, cell markers consistent with myoblasts or myogenic cells. And then finally up at the top here, we see a population of cells that expresses much more mature muscle markers. And so a way to analyze this is by using something called pseudo time analysis, whereby you can actually look at the expression patterns um, of these different cells and try to line them up across a trajectory which seems to predict their differentiation. And so doing this with the help of Dr. Garcia, what we've seen is a proposed pseudo time lineage by which FAPs are transitioning transcriptionally into myoblasts and then into myocytes. And this is further substantiated by looking at the gene expression gradients of some of the uh, key genes here, including PRM16, which should decrease from this A366 inhibitor. So what we see here looking over on the left is that uh, you have the highest amount of PRDM16 and FAPs and then as you follow that pseudo time trajectory, this progressively decreases to the point where you have almost no expression of PRDM16 in the myocytes. You see the same pattern with PDGF or alpha. So you see that it's highly expressed in the FAPS, decreases somewhat in the myoblast population, and then is lowest in the myocyte population. And you see that pattern with myoD as well. So myoD is a marker of myoblasts. It starts to be expressed by FAPS along this trajectory here, is highly expressed in myoblasts, and then remains stable or decreases somewhat in the myocyte population. And finally, this last gene, myoG, is a marker of mature myotubes. And what you see is that there's a gradual incremental expression in this gene, which really happens once you get over to the myocyte population. So to wrap things up, I want to remind you where we started and then give an indication of where our work might be headed. We began with the idea that FAPs are largely responsible for fatty infiltration and fibrosis across a variety of muscle conditions and that it would be a good idea to inhibit their proliferation and differentiation. And we did this using small molecule inhibitors. We then sought to promote the differentiation of FAPs into a beige adipose phenotype using both beta adrenergic agonists as well as cellular transplantation. Next, we wanted to try and isolate and concentrate the specific factors from these beige FAPs and deliver them to injured muscle. And we did this using an exosome-based treatment with the help of our colleagues in the Refi lab. Moving forward and based on the single cell data that we were starting to collect, we wanted to investigate whether FAPs can donate mitochondria to neighboring muscle cells. And indeed, it seems that they can and that this mitochondrial donation seems to convey a promyogenic impact. And then finally, and currently, we're wondering whether maybe with the right epigenetic influence, FAPs can actually transform directly into muscle. And so that's kind of the area of active investigation. And here's a summary of the different uh, translational approaches that we have investigated and are currently investigating with regard to muscle degeneration. So in conclusion, we began with this notion that FAPs are primary contributors to pathologic uh, muscle fatty infiltration and fibrosis in a wide variety of muscle disease states. Um, we've discovered that their differentiation phenotype can be altered through beta agonism in both mouse and human cells. And recently we've been investigating exosome-based therapeutics, enhancing mitochondrial transfer and epigenetic-based transdifferentiation of FAPs into myoblasts 
as some emerg emerging avenues by which we hope to translate these findings to addressing muscle degeneration across the spectrum of degenerative muscle diseases. So expanding our scope and moving forward with Dr. Garcia at the helm in the Feely Lou lab, we're beginning to look at a broader range of disease processes, including ALS and spinal cord injury in collaboration with some of the uh, spine labs over at San Francisco General. Additionally, we're beginning to explore the role of epigenetics in maintaining cell fate. And particularly with Dr. Garcia's expertise, we're continuing to use single cell RNA sequencing to predict key regulators of FAP differentiation pathways. So I'd like to thank everyone who helped me with this talk and helped me review it, particularly my fiance, Gina Yu, Sachin, Dr. Feely, Dr. Liu, and I want to thank all the rest of my PIs and mentors and everyone in the Feely Lu lab who contributed research to this talk. Thank you. All right, um, that was an excellent talk and congratulations on all of the work that you've done, Dr. Davies. Um, and then also congratulations on the recent engagement. Um, and it looks like we do have a few minutes for questions. Uh, so if anybody um, has anything, um, I see a hand up from Dr. Marcuccio, so maybe we'll start there. Yeah, sorry, it takes me a minute to unmute. That was a really good talk. Um, I have a question about your pseudotime analysis. So you, you essentially see these FAPs, which are a stable cell type, and then you see myocytes, which are a stable cell type. Do you actually see the point where the cells are um, making the decision to become myoblasts as opposed to adipocytes? Do you actually see that like tipping point? Yeah, so interest, So in, in this particular pseudotime analysis, I think um, that sort of tipping point between myocytes and adipocytes is a little bit harder to detect uh, mm -hmm. with the early data. But we've also conducted pseudotime analysis just looking at the adipogenic uh, lineage. So mm -hmm. going back a few slides. Uh, experiment where we were first at uh, the single cell plots. We've conducted pseudotime on, on that, and we actually are able to see sort of a, a junction bet, uh, between, between where cells want to become a fibrogenic cell type versus an adipogenic cell type. So basically mm -hmm. using this plot, we've yeah. also performed pseudotime on this and seen one branch going up towards the adipogenic cells and then another branch actually sort of looping around from say maybe population three to four to two back towards a fibrogenic phenotype. So in, in, in that situation, do you see cells that are expressing both um, molecular programs? And so then one gets suppressed and the other one gets maintained? Do you see like that we, kind of cell population? We, we do, yes, to a small degree. So particularly actually in this population nine, I think that's mm -hmm. going to be an interesting population to yeah. consider because you start to see really high myOD expression uh, concomitantly with high PDGFR alpha expression within the yeah, 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 that's cool. Yeah, cool. That's awesome. Thanks. All right, uh, Dr. Bailey. Great talk, Michael. You have a really good way of explaining really complex things to a broad audience. Um, my question is, on some of the stuff you showed where you guys did um, a therapeutic intervention on the biopsy samples, do you think that to have muscle regeneration that you will need some sort of exercise stimulus or some sort of stimulus on that muscle? alongside the intervention to um, get better results? Yeah, I mean, I think that an, an exercise stimulus to kind of re rehabilitate the environment in which we might be putting a drug or some of these cells would absolutely make sense to kind of optimize the results uh, of that translational type approach. I mean, I think one thing we've seen here for sure is that the environment within the muscle matters a ton. So if there's a lot of chronic inflammation that really seems to be a strong sim stimulus for these cells to differentiate into fat and fibrosis. And I think, you know, by using modalities um, such as exercise, you know, that, that could be really helpful. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Lotz. Well, thank you. Uh, great presentation, uh, Michael. I had a quick question. In the beginning, you talked about um, changes of penation angle and how that might be an initiating factor. And, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are about what, how does injury signal conversion in muscle and are mitochondria involved? Yeah, so um, I think 
at least from, from our group's perspective, we're just now really starting to consider the full scope of mitochondria within that process. But the more and more you look at the rotator cuff literature, which was kind of in the setting of that um, Christian Gerber study at the beginning describing the panation angle, the more you see that there seems to be a, an overall decrease in oxidative metabolism, even in these you know, tendon and possibly nerve type injuries. So I think we're gonna see that across a broad spectrum of muscle diseases, you do see these subtle metabolic changes and sometimes they're not so subtle in the setting of diseases like ALS or mitochondrial myopathies. Um, but, you know, I think that this idea that mesenchymal stem cells can potentially be transferring mitochondria back and forth is something that should heavily be investigated in muscle given how highly metabolic of a tissue it is. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Fields. Great, thanks, Michael. That was a terrific talk. Um, my question is about the rotator cuff tear model. Um, I'm just curious, do you know, is it the tear itself or is it the nerve resection or maybe both that's playing a role in the aggregation and proliferation of these FAPs? And I guess more generally, um, is there, is it known whether there's crosstalk between nerve and muscle um, in terms of the formation of these FAPs and, and the proliferation of these FAPs or other tissues, uh, muscle and other tissues? Yeah, great, great questions, Dr. Fields. So starting first with the injury model itself, uh, we've definitely isolated the tendon injury component separate from the nerve component and looked at the amount of fat and fibrosis that develops from each. And ultimately what we see is that it's an additive effect. So if you see you know, a tendon only injury, you get a little bit of fatty infiltration and a little bit of fibrosis. And if you have a nerve only injury, um, you do see a fair amount of fatty infiltration and fibrosis. And then if you combine the two of them, you see even more than each one alone. Um, regarding your second question, I, I apologize. Could you, could you repeat part of the... the... Yeah, I, I guess I was just curious if there's and you sort of answered this with your first question is, is if there are signals or crosstalk from other tissues that are responsible for the proliferation of these FAPs and, and this, you know, um, fibrotic uh, muscle conversion that occurs, like, is it, is it solely because of the muscle injury um, or is it, is there some communication that's, that's occurring between the muscle and other tissues um, just in general, whether it's nerve or, or other, other um, tissue systems? Yeah, absolutely. So there, there have been some studies looking at the role of FAPs and the maintenance of the neuromuscular junction, actually, that have come out within the past year or so. And it does seem that certain populations of FAPs secrete growth factors, which help maintain the neuromuscular junction. And so actually the, the Uazumi group, like one of the original leading groups that described these cells, see, uh, recently published a paper, I think, in Nature, looking at FAPs and their, and their maintenance of the neuromuscular junction through the secretion of certain growth factors. And so I think that's another important area of investigation is that this isn't just a muscle problem, this is also a neuromuscular problem. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Brack. So I think you're still on mute. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks, Michael. That's a really impressive program you've built over the last few years. Uh, so congratulations. Um, I was intrigued by the um, relationship between the beta adrenergic agonist and the sort of convert, direct conversion to muscle. And I think, you know, Shingo Kajimura a couple of years ago showed something similar in vivo in a mouse, but it was clearly not shown. It was exosome mediated. So that's really impressive. And in human cells, indeed. Um, in terms of that signaling cascade, it looks from your single cell seek that the receptors uh, are in either very lonely expressed or in a very rare population of cells. How do you, do you think basically the transcript is not a good readout of those cells? Um, and or do you think that there's an effect more broadly in a larger population to give you this dramatic effect of beta adrenergic mediated fat function? Yeah, so that's, that's a really good question and something that we've also been scratching our heads about a little bit over the single cell data in particular. Um, definitely what we've seen from the human cells that underwent single cell is that primarily, first of all, the beta-2 adrenergic receptor more than the beta-3 adrenergic receptor is expressed in a subset of, of FAPs. 
and that that doesn't seem to fully account for the big changes that we see in overall mitochondrial gene expression. So, you know, we're wondering if there could be off target effects, not directly through that beta two signaling cascade. Uh, but also it seems like the lineage tracing that we've done with that using kind of preliminary pseudotime analysis is actually one more of trans differentiation from, from a white fat precursor into a beige fat precursor as opposed to sort of a branch point by which these FAPs are going either white or beige. And this is all based on the, the human cell data, but it seems like we're almost pushing these cells past a white fat phenotype into mm -hmm. the point where they're starting to express UCP1 at the end of this lineage trajectory, uh, as, as opposed to you know, taking them from the beginning and creating like this separate branch point. If, if I could make it maybe add something to that. Um, I mean, the danger with lineage and all these pseudotimes, right, is, you, is you're forcing a relationship. Right. And obviously all FAPs don't move to muscle. Sure. One, other, one suggestion could be to use flow cytometry and subgate the FAPs and put them in different cell culture dishes and ask which ones become the myogenic population. Mm -hmm. Then you can always go back and do the single cell seek. Yes. Um, just a suggestion, but a great talk. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. And then um, I think we're just at time, but I know Dr. Allison had her hand up and um, just posted in the chat box, but um, do you wanna comment or pose a quick question? Uh, my main question is if mitochondrial transfer is one of the um, bases for age-related decline in skeletal function. Uh, so it's just a broad question, but uh, overall just great talk. And it was exciting to hear what you've been up to the whole group. Thanks, Dr. Allison. Yeah, I mean, I think that'll be a, a really interesting area to to look to in the future, since this seems to be such a, a new process that we're just beginning to understand. Great, and um, just a couple other comments in the chat box before we finish up, um, just from Dr. Vale that this was a spectacular presentation, and then from Dr. Wostrak that this was an amazing talk, and uh, I would echo those comments and really congratulations on uh, such impressive work. Um, and then one last piece of um, info is we will be sending the um, attendance survey uh, via email. So just check that, uh, make sure to open and log in for the um, CME credit. But uh, Dr. Davies, congrats again. And um, thank you all for joining and um, we'll see you back next week. Thanks, Dr. Lansdowne. Thank you, everyone.